Thank you very much for that. And Dr. Elliott, just a really quick story. Um, um, I started out in the Army. I had a great Army career, 36 years of a HUA career. Um, but before that, I had applied out of high school for all kinds of um, scholarships and the academies. And I wasn't getting picked up for anything. And then I got a four-year Naval ROTC scholarship to Tulane. And I was going to go because I liked that double-breasted uniform, and there were a lot of pretty girls down there. So that was it. <laughs> And then Congressman Satterfield gave me a congressional appointment to West Point, and that steered me to the Army, and the rest is history. But that's my Navy story. So maybe I'm a frustrated Naval officer. <laughs> but you know, thank you all very much for the invitation. And uh, Kendra, thank you so much for inviting me today. How many of you were at the, I, I was the DEI visiting speaker at, at Walter Reed um, just last week? OK, good, because some of the things I'm going to say are very, very similar. Um, you know, so I'm the CEO of Holy Cross Health in the Maryland region of Trinity Health, and Holy Cross is one of the five special pathogen assessment hospitals in the state of Maryland. So we diagnosed the first two cases of COVID in the state on the 4th of, of March um, of 2020, so 67 weeks ago, and then the very next day, the third patient attributed to Washington, D.C., and it took off from there. So because we have cared for more than 7,000 patients with about 3,500 being COVID positive, I have been on the speaking circuit about COVID, 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 post-COVID, para-COVID, COVID long haul. But here recently, after the summer of social justice, and people started picking up, hey, there's, there's a lot going on, and we really need to emphasize diversity, equity, and inclusion, I have become sort of the poster child and one of the speakers for that. I was the, I'm the first um, African-American CEO in Trinity Health. Trinity Health is the third largest Catholic health system in the United States, has 94 hospitals in 22 states, and I'm the first African-American CEO. We now have three out of 94 hospitals. Um, so that's where it is. But I'm the, the DEI speaker and one of the representatives for Trinity. This has also been a difficult week for me because of the airing of the stories about the Tulsa race massacre. I was actually born in Tulsa, grew up there, left there when, uh, to go to high school because I integrated, I was one of the first black students to integrate um, a, a prestigious uh, Episcopal school, and I caught hell for two years. And so my father, who was a physician who had gotten to Oklahoma in 1936, decided to hell with it. He was sick and tired of the racism in Tulsa, and we were gonna move back to someplace less racist where he was from, Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, <laughs> where I went to a, a, an all-white military high school. So there you go. There you have it. But this has been a rough week because of all of the memories and things that have drawn up. And then my speaking for DEI and, and at Walter Reed, people ask me a lot of questions about the racism that I encountered in my 36 years in the Army. And I had suppressed a lot of it. You know, you can't succeed if you, if, if you hang on to all of that. But being asked it and then seeing all of the stuff about the Tulsa race massacre and everything has just brought back so many memories that have flooded that I'm exhausted. I have not slept well in the last week. It's just so many things rattling around. So what I ha had wanted to do tonight is I have some fixed comments that I wanted to make about a few things. And then I just wanted to open the floor and have a discussion, you know, um, non-attributional, uh, even though we're on camera, we'll, we'll be a little careful, but um, nonetheless, um, any questions that you have and want to ask, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about it. So we are where we are today in healthcare because of American history, and it's as simple as that. And usually when I give talks around DEI, I have a great picture of my dad, and I, I completely forgot to bring it um, with me today, but um, when he was a young graduate physician, um, it's, you know, a, a good-looking young black man standing erect in his white, his white outfit with his medical bag standing next to a car. And it's what's on the door of the car that's important. It's at Kansas City Health Department, sick call car, colored division. So that tells you that right there, from the state to the city, the county, through the health department, that it was public policy that healthcare was divided into black and white. And so one of the things that my dad used to tell me was that he recognized that there were, there were three things that were problematic about that. And, and no matter how valiantly he tried to treat his patients, there were obstacles in his way. Number one, there were restrictions to higher levels of care for those patients who were in the colored division of healthcare. Number two, there were restrictions on him. He could only practice in certain places. 
And then number three, his patients could only afford the medic med medications that they could afford or the medications that they were given by the county and the, even those medications were potentially subject to bias. And all of that was set in law. And so that's the issue. So health policy um, affecting African Americans particularly and subsequently affecting other minorities can be traced directly back to 1619 with the arrival of human beings in bondage and then codified later in our constitution the subsequent generations would be seen as only three-fifths of a human being. And then in the 19th and 20th centuries from genetics to genomics, it was established as fact that black brains are smaller and so intelligence is limited, that black instincts are intrinsically animalistic and hypersexual, that pain tolerance is high, skin texture is tough, black bones are more dense, and laziness is a major inherited genetic trait. So these myths and these lies have basically formed the basis of healthcare and health education for two centuries and actually still influence us today. I mean, how many of us were taught that a big black man in the ER doesn't need as much pain medicine as somebody else because genetically he can tolerate pain more? I was taught that. In my dermatology residency, we had a, in, in one of our books, uh, Rook and Wilkinson, a big four volume book, um, there was a chapter on blackness as if black skin was a disease state. And I was the only black resident in dermatology at Fort Sam Houston at the time. And believe me, I raised holy hell and they, they labeled me an angry black man. But I couldn't, I couldn't take that every time they talked about black skin, it was, as if, it was as if it was a disease state. So with the passage of Jim Crow legislation in the late 19th century, separate but equal, became the law of the land and policies designed to clarify race began to impact every aspect of life. The one drop rule, where one drop of black blood would make you genetically black, was a theme with variations across the state, such as in Virginia, where one eighth black blood made you black, and in Louisiana, where one thirty second black heritage placed you in a different socioeconomic class and not just based on the color of your skin and it further limited your access to health care and to services. And as a side note, the Louisiana legislature finally voted to abolish that rule in 1983, but it was not by a unanimous vote. So we're coming out of the pandemic and the pandemic has really laid bare the inequities in health care, particularly for black and brown communities. And so it's up to those of you who are future health care leaders to ensure that in your communities, on your bases, and really in your future, you do as much work as you can to create real and true equity, which doesn't mean equal access or equal treatment for all, but it really means the right treatment for the right person in the right place at the right time for the right reason. You see the patient as an individual and not just a part of a group or a cohort or a demographic. And health inequity absolutely impacts health outcomes in underserved communities, many of which are black and brown, BIPOC as it's now called, or Latinx. Um, but we also have to realize that when we're biased against these communities, we're also impacting anyone else who may be also at or below the poverty level and is likewise economically and socially marginalized. So we're marginalizing a lot of our fellow American citizens. If we look at it through a different lens, it's all about economics. It's about creating a healthy workforce, beginning at birth, that will support cities, counties, um, and the nation. And systemic racism in our health system marked and masked as inequity and inequality is a threat to our competitiveness on a global stage. It's a threat to our security and it's a threat to our future because after all, health security is national security. And while racism is morally reprehensible from an economic standpoint, it's really just plain stupid. And that's a discussion for a whole nother day. So let me get back to what we're really here tonight to talk about, and that's the big elephant in the room, and that's the military and racism. So the first thing I think is that the military has sort of been ahead of the civilian sector for a long time. With the desegregation of the forces in the late 1940s, people did what people did. They joined the military, went around the world, met people, married them, brought them back. So the military has been very, very tolerant of interracial marriages for, for a very long time. Um, people had kids with them. 
They became part of our American fiber. And then if you think about the regulatory standpoint, um, we have lived under EO, EEO, anti-discrimination rules that have been mandated on the federal side for decades. So you can almost think that maybe DEI really started, at least DNI, maybe not the E, the e part, but the D and the I part started in the military or has at least been, been helped by being in the military. And one of the things that it did also, though, for me personally, was it really started me on a path to what we're now calling cultural humility, where I really had to learn a little bit about all of these different cultures that we were encountering if I was to adequately treat my patients well. Because how many stereotypes, you think they're stereotypes just about being black or brown, marry people from around the world, and I mean, you've got you know, the, the, the stoic um, Asian. And I was a clinic commander in Korea for two years. People in pain are, are in pain. There's nothing, that's stoic stuff. That's in a kung fu movie. That, that's not real, but that's also what we're taught. You know, so you have to kind of unbias yourself and deconstruct yourself and recognize that there are things about other people that, that you don't know and that you need to learn and you need to appreciate to be able to really treat your patients well. So each of you is a leader and over time you're gonna be given greater authority and greater responsibility and, and more and more people to lead. And so how will you guarantee the diversity of ideas and thought that guarantee health equity? That's something to think about. But the answer really should be very, very simple. You have to lead by example. You have to lead by the front, by the, from the front. You have to model what right looks like. You have to make sure that every decision that you make is about fairness and about equity and about merit. You need to get to know your people on a level deeper than just on the superficial level, on the human level and on a personal level. Um, at least in the military, we have an overarching culture by which we all live. We have mission, vision, and values that we all share. And so we can unite around that despite whatever differences we might have. I have found in five years in the civilian sector that is not necessarily the case. And that makes leading through particularly times like this a little bit harder um, because emotions can be a little bit more raw. But one of the things um, that you have to, to do is recognizing that even within that overarching culture or those individual service cultures, people are still people. And if you get to know them on a personal level, and sometimes if you get to know that person, who they are and what they are outside of work, that's more important than who they are and what they are at work. And once you get to know them, you recognize their strengths, their weaknesses, you know then how to better lead them, how to get them to consensus and basically get them to do what it is that you need them to do. And that's one of the, the, the parts of the art um, of leadership. Um, the military is a microcosm of our larger society. So the things that we're seeing today that are happening around social justice, and with the insurrection at the Capitol recently and all of these other things that are going on, um, those things are experienced in the military as well. Um, and I've certainly experienced bias and discrimination in the 36 years that, that I spent in the Army. Um, I think the biggest one was sometimes not being seen as either an officer or a doctor, but simply as being seen as black, black guy in uniform. See the uniform coming, you see a black guy. It's a black guy in a uniform, probably enlisted. Looks a little bit older, probably an NCO, but not an officer and definitely not a doctor. Um, I have had my credentials question. I've had my pedigree question. So I, I was appointed to West Point, as I said. I had, there was so much racism at West Point. I was like, my God, I came from Richmond, Virginia, and I'm getting called the N-word more up here on the Hudson than ever before. So I left the academy. Um, and went to Howard and matriculated to Howard and got my commission from ROTC. When I got to my first duty station at Fort George G. Meade, Maryland in the 85th Med Battalion, um, they said, you graduated from Harvard? I said, no, Howard. And they were like, oh, well, it's a black school. So that ROTC program was probably substandard. And I'm thinking, okay, all, this, all the ROTC program started in 1916. Howard's ROTC program has been responsible for more officers from World War I through every war we fought in the 20th century than any other school on the planet. 
How is that substandard simply because it's Howard and not Harvard? And then if they found out that I left the academy, it was certainly because I flunked out or I had disciplinary actions. It couldn't be that I left on my own. No one would be that crazy to do that. So for years, I dropped West Point out of my resume, out of my CV, out of my lexicon, until I wound up as the commander of the hospital and the surgeon for the United States Military Academy as one of my assignments prior to getting the command at Walter Reed. And that's when you know, West Point kind of came back. But for years, for about 20, 25 years, it was suppressed because it was actually held against me um, more than it would have been anybody else. My caduceus was often mistaken for sergeant stripes. So I was selected uh, in residence command and general staff college, which a lot of doctors do not get uh, picked up for in residence. You, you do it by distance education. So I went and for the year end exercise, I was the digital division surgeon for the fourth ID for the, for the, for the play. Um, and I happened to go from my staff room to another staff room to talk to another one of the medical officers. And when I walked in, the instructor, who was also a major just like me, looked at me and said, yes, Sergeant Coots, what can I do for you? And I said, okay, black guy in a uniform. He saw the name, Coots, got that right, couldn't look up on this collar and see a major's oak leaf and looked over here at that black caduceus and thought that was a set of stripes. But it's also happened with our colleagues before. Same place, the, the Command and General Staff College. Um, I did a partial ditty move, I injured my thumb, I had some swelling and some redness, and I looked at it and I said, okay, either I've got an infection or I've got a seroma, I'd better go in and get it seen. So I put my uniform on, went to sick call, Young captain sat down, started looking at me, tell me your story. I said, well, I got it injured, it's red, it's hot. I think I either have an infection or I have a seroma, and I think we ne might need to do a cut down and drain it just to kind of see what it is. He never looked up at me. He said, so, so let's talk about this. He said, pus is caused by little bugs called bacteria. And I said, captain, stop. I said, look up at me. I said, you have never looked at me. He looked at me. I said, look on my right collar, oak leaf. I said, look on my left. I said, what emblem do you see? I said, the same one you were. I said, I'm a board certified dermatologist and dermatosurgeon. I said, I said, I either have an infection or a seroma. How many of your patients walk in saying that and saying, I think we might need to do a cut down and see if there's pus or, or what's going on? was the only reaction from it. And begrudgingly, he did a cut down. It was a seroma, thank you. I got my answer, I walked out of there, and that was fine. He never spoke to me again, even though I would pass him in the clinic sometimes, I never spoke to him again either, because I no longer needed him after that first day, when I realized who he was and what he was. And I wasn't even gonna waste the time trying to mentor him. And maybe that's a mistake on my part. When I was an MSC, out of Howard, I got sent to the logistics course in Fort Sam Houston, 90 days down at Fort Sam, came back, trained logistics officer. First thing my battalion commander did was said, okay, Coots, I need you to go over to the hospital and do a piss test. He, and I said, sir? He said, yeah, you've been at Fort Sam and you went to Howard, so I don't know what you might do. And I'm thinking, I was at Fort Sam in a 90-day, well-regulated course, and yes, I drove back from San Antonio to here, but I, I'm sure I wasn't you know, smoking weed and doing, doing other things on the route back, but I wondered, who else he might have ever said that to? And I asked some of the other lieutenants when they went away, did, and they were like, no, never happened to us. And so, it, you know, little things like that would happen all along the way. And then there are all the little microaggressions that we're all very used to, right? Gee, you don't, you don't sound black on the telephone when they meet you in person. Or you look like a black white guy because of your features. You must have gotten those through slavery. I'm like, yeah, maybe so, probably. It's probably the truth. Um, I'm amazed at how articulate you are. Well, boy, you sure do speak well. How did you learn to speak like that? And I'm thinking, it, what are you talking about? Why would I not be able to speak well? And then when I was the Deputy Corps Surgeon for Fifth Corps during the Kosovo campaign, there were two black lieutenant colonels in the, on the staff, and I was the clinical deputy and Johnny Garnett was the operational deputy. And we were out at a big field exercise at Grafenbeer, and our commander was a white colonel. And he showed up, 
and he pulled us together and he sat down and said, man, you guys have been doing a great job. And he said, and I really apologize because I've been working you two boys like a couple of field slaves. And I was about to lean across the table and Johnny put his hand on my chest and pushed me back and he held up his hand and he said, sir, you cannot look at two black officers that are subordinate to you and call them field slaves. And he said, well, you know, I was just joking with you. It's just a thing, you're black, I'm white, you know, I'm working you, you're slaves. Didn't work, didn't go over. But all of those little things have happened all along the way. Um, but what I did was I would center myself because I remembered um, a guy who was a year ahead of me in medical school. And I did start out at Howard, but I finished up at the University of Oklahoma, where I was one of five students in my class, and five black students in the class. And um, the student from the year ahead of me would get all these microaggressions all the time, and he would just sit there so calmly. And I said, Joe, what's, what's, what's your secret? And he said, you know, I'm not gonna let these folks bother me. He didn't call them folks, he called them something else, but we're on camera, so I'm gonna say folks. <laughs> he said, I'm not gonna let these folks bother me. He said, I'm just gonna get, give them to Jesus and let Jesus worry about them. And I thought about that too. I said, you know, every time I encounter ignorance, if it isn't going to adversely directly impact me, then I'm not even gonna worry about it. I like that philosophy. Give them to Jesus, let Jesus worry about them, and you continue to march. And do not allow them to be an obstacle in your way. Um, last story about this. Um, I, was the, I was in the Surgeon General's office, my first assignment at the Pentagon, and I was the uh, senior Medical Staff Officer for Health Policy and Services. I was on the elevator, and there was um, a Korean American colonel, Colonel Kim. And I recognized him because he was my assignments officer when I was a Medical Service Corps officer. And he looked at me and he saw Coots, and he recognized me too. He said, Coots, I was your assignments officer, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, when you got commissioned, you asked for a hospital unit because you said you wanted to be a doctor. So you wanted a hospital unit? I said, yes, sir. I said, but I want up an 85th Med Battalion. He said, that's right. He said, we assigned you to a field hospital. He said, because one thing we learned was that, that you aristocratic blacks do very well in the field in armor and signal and things like that, but you don't do well in the field in the Medical Service Corps. You do well in a fixed facility hospital, but you all fail in the field. So we assigned you there to see if you would fail or if he would survive. And I remember kind of leaning back against the, the, the wall of the, of the elevator, and I said, damn, it really was a plan perpetrated by the man designed to keep a brother down. That is true. Um, so there are things that you might believe are happening to you, and chances are they are. No matter how wild they may seem, it's like, did I just experience that? Or why did I get this assignment? Why is this happening to me? You know, it might actually be a plan. You, you never know. I would hope now, all of these years later, it is not still the case. But I fear that because we are a microcosm of the larger society, it happens. Um, as a general, it wasn't much different, unfortunately. Again, black guy in a uniform is what you see. And if you didn't see my bald head under a hat, I used to look fairly youthful, even as a general. So, you know, maybe you made a mistake here or there. Except there was a star on the hat. And there was a star in the center of the uniform. And people would not salute me. And I remember one day I stopped a young specialist for not saluting me. And he said, oh my God, sir. He said, I, I didn't see the star. He said, I saw you and you look too young. So I figured you were a specialist. And I just said, you know what? This is your lucky day because you are my new best friend. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you off, but I want you to pay attention now when you go by. So what I wound up doing, I actually had a larger star made to put on my hat because you know, in a tactical situation, wear these small stars so that you're not a target. I would rather risk being a target <laughs> because that's respect that you're due. And how many times are you gonna tolerate being disrespected because all they see coming is black in a uniform. So there were two black one stars in Afghanistan when I was there and one two star. And you won't mistake a two star because there are two stars on there and no, no other rank has two things on it. But for the two of us, one stars, they couldn't keep us straight. The senior staff officers could because they knew who we were. 
but the average folks and the average officers couldn't keep us apart. Now, I'm 5'11", always been just a little bit pudgy, wear glasses, medium brown skin. The other, the other one star was 6'2", extremely slender, no glasses, much browner than I am. And they could not keep us apart. They would call me his name and call him mine. Why? Because all black people look alike, of course. That's another common misconception and a common thing. So all the way to the very end of my career, from the beginning, from the first beginning to the end, I encountered things all the way along the way. And I retired in 2016, so it's only been five years. So it's not like I retired 20 years ago or something like that. So I think that those are the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of racism. But one of the things I do want to say is that you do have to center yourself because when these things crop up, and they inevitably will, if you don't handle them well and not let them bother you, you risk being labeled an angry black man or an angry black woman. And I can't tell you how many officers of my year group and peer group I have talked to who said, oh yeah, I was the only one in my residency and they call me an angry black woman. Oh yeah, I was the only one in my residency, they call me an angry black man. Because you would get incensed by the microaggressions. Or you would listen to them talk about an African American patient or a brown patient or an Asian patient or something and the disparaging things that they would say would irritate you and you felt a sense of rage and a, and a sense that you had to speak up. And maybe not everyone, but I, I certainly did. Um, you know, growing up in the civil rights era in Oklahoma, both my parents were involved in it. I couldn't let that, that ride. And if I had already made the decision to leave West Point because of it, I certainly wasn't gonna tolerate it um, along the way either. So the last thing I wanna say is um, just a little bit of mentoring to you all while I have you here. And that is about living your career journey. You need to take every, every opportunity to avail yourself of any additional training courses that the military offers you. The staff college, the war college, special medical strategy courses, anything like that. And the reason I say that is, and, and you need to be prepared to branch out into administrative roles as well as purely clinical roles to really be able to advance your career if you want to, if you want to move up. And the reason I say that is because for each and every one of you, you will have to define what success looks like. But there's only one definition of luck. And so many people get assignments and you look at them and say, wow, Coots was lucky. How is he so lucky to get that? I remember I was asked that when I went from, from command in the hospital up at West Point to command in Walter Reed in, in those final three years. Um, why, why were you so lucky? Well, I got a call from General Schoomaker. This is 2008, you know, the bloodletting had happened, the Surgeon General had been relieved, uh, at the hospital commander, everyone at, 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 at Walter Reed and leadership um, had pretty much been moved out all the way up to the Secretary of the Army who was fired because of that. So General Schoomaker called me and said, Van, he said, I need to put you in this assignment, but I need you to talk to your wife about it because this may end your career. But you are the only person I can put in this assignment because Congress has mandated that it has to be someone who's already had multiple commands and at least sitting in a level one command currently who's also a war college graduate. And even though I had not been selected for war college and resident, I was gonna, I was gonna try to wait for it because I'd been staff college and resident, I should be war college and resident too. General Granger told me, he said, man, he said, Coos, don't wait for this. He said, get it done, get it done, get it done. Because once you get that done, all doors will be open for you. And that's the definition of luck is being the only one prepared when that window of opportunity or that door of opportunity opens to you. Your patients will never, ever give up on you. So never give up. So this was a rambling soliloquy. I hope I touched on all the subjects, but the goal was to make a few points and then just open the floor to, to a discussion. Um, as, as BK said, I've always been approachable. You can ask me anything, I'll tell you. Um, if it's a hard truth, I'll tell you a hard truth. If you want an easy lie, preface your question with, I asked you this question, but I'd like an easy lie. <laughs> Thank you. So that's a good question. How do, you, how do you identify a mentor or someone who is for you? I've always told people that you need to have several mentors. 
not just one, because you have to have several different points of view. Um, you need to have someone who is like you, as close to like you as possible, but then you need to have the other two mentors who are not like you. So if you're a man, at least one of your mentors needs to be a senior female. If you're black, at least one of your mentors needs to be white or Hispanic or something else, somebody um, other than you. Um, if you look up and you don't see who, anyone who looks like you, you need to step out and find somebody but, because guaranteed somewhere in that medical facility where you're training is a senior um, African American. So just go up and ask them and say, hey, you're the only one who looks like me. Will you give me some tips? Will you mentor me? But find two other people who are successful uh, or who you perceive to be successful and who may be willing to, to help you and approach, him, uh, approach you and ask. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, mentoring isn't easy and, and being a mentee isn't easy and nobody walks right up and says, hey, Coots, I want to mentor you. You know, you have to ask for that. And actually, one of my mentors was, um, was General Schoomaker when he was a colonel and there was the Ermsey commander. I was the DCCS at Heidelberg. I was lieutenant colonel. I had never had a mentor up to the, to the point of lieutenant colonel. I'm thinking, my God, thank God I made it to lieutenant colonel without a mentor. But, you know, at Fifth Corps, I was labeled an angry black man, too, and the general pulled me in and talked to me about being an angry black man. So I said, okay, I need to make some changes. So when I went over to Heidelberg to be the DCCS, I met general, uh, uh, then Colonel Schoomaker, and I just went up and asked him. I said, he's the, he's the, he's the or, or rather, he's the 30th Med Brigade commander. I said, this is the top dog over here for operational medicine. I'm just going to go up and say, hey, sir, I'm Van Coos. Will you be my mentor? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, okay, that's fine. I mean, sometimes that's just the way it is. And that relationship that you build will last forever. And maybe that's also one of the reasons that when it came time to choose the commander for the final years of Walter Reed, he said, oh yeah, I've been mentoring you all along. I know I can trust you because in some ways I know how you think. And I know you think a little bit like me, at least. So that's what I would say. More than one, at least one who does not look like you and is not like you, to get a different point of view. Well, I mean, for me, it was even harder in dermatology. I mean, at the time I, I went through, there were 75 black dermatologists in the United States. I wasn't going to see one. Um, you know, there were a couple in the military, one in the Navy and one in the Army. Um, or, and then one of my uh, residency classmates at another site, Nadja West, who became the Surgeon General, was a residency classmate, but she was in Colorado when I was in San Antonio. So I wasn't going to find myself. Now there are about 250 black dermatologists. But then, there are only 75, so I was not going to find somebody like me um, in the same specialty to mentor me. So I said, okay, specialty agnostic, I just need a mentor to survive, to be able to survive. So this has been a little bit of a downer. Um, let me lift this up just a little bit. There are positives along the way, though, too. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that I have been places and there have been either, either um, uh, uh, black soldiers or sailors or airmen um, and officers who have never seen a black general and who wanted to come up to me and just shake my hand or give me a robust salute. Sometimes, sir, can I give you a hug? I'm like, yeah, give me, come on, give me a hug, let's hug. Um, because they were so proud to see one because you know, in, the, in the medical department, there, there were, in the Army Medical Department, certainly, there were, there were many of us. When I was in, there were quite a bit of, and, and there are today. That hasn't always been the case. And there are periods where you don't see any and you, and you won't see any. So the rare occurrence that you see one, um, people, people want to give you a hug. As I flew around Afghanistan and went to different bases, the people would see me and like, sir, can I take a picture with you? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, absolutely. So there, there are positives to it as well, because you do serve as a role model as you move up. And there are people who are as proud of what you have done as they would be if they were in that position themselves. So for every negative, there's a positive, kind of like the yin and the yang. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Sir, you mentioned you had a, a wife and two children. I do. I'd love to hear your, your perspective on that and how far in your career that happened. And oh, OK. So all right, so, so, so here's a hard truth. OK, so um, my first marriage um, lasted four years. Um, my wife did not like the military and decided to leave and come back to the East Coast while I was out in Texas. Um, my second wife lasted seven years, decided she did not like the military, and went back to where she was from, which was San Diego. So I am currently on my third wife, first set of children. We have been married 17 years now. 
Um, I'm very lucky. She loved the military. She loved to travel. She loved to dress up in the, in the ball gowns and do all of those things. So I was like, oh my God, I finally found it. You know? <laughs> I'm so very happy. You know, um, uh, so, so it's, uh, you know, so there you go. There's the, there's the perspective. So I have late children. So um, my, my kids, my son just turned 14. My daughter will be 13 this summer. They were, uh, my son was born when I was a commander up at West Point. So I'm a colonel having my first child. Um, so I used to tell my soldiers, even as a general, I said, I'm an old general with the family of a captain or a lieutenant. So I said, I understand what you're going through. You know, so there was, you, you know, you always try to find a common ground. So my common ground was, I'm walking my kids to Ramstein Elementary School while you're walking your kids too. If you're a little late, I got you because I'm a little late today too. So, so it's okay. My wife is from Colombia. Um, and so my kids are, are perfectly bilingual in Spanish and, and, and English. My wife has given me a lot of perspectives on racism and bias against um, uh, Hispanics, especially Latinas. And I can remember with her thick accent, um, you know, there was one woman up at West Point, and she was a wife of um, Major, and we were in the senior officers group. So my wife was in the senior off wives, officers' wives club. And she's trying to say something to her, and she said in a syrupy accent, honey, I just don't understand what the hell it is you're trying to say. Can't you speak English? I got so mad, I started flying in that direction. My wife knew what was coming, so she, boom, she stood in between me and that, uh, that lady um, because I was about to give her a run up and down. So I, I, I've seen it from, from all sides. And right now, I'm actually having a problem. My kids don't want to speak Spanish because they don't want to be labeled Latinos. Or whatever and I'm like but you guys you are you're African-American you're Latino you're this I said speaking Spanish will save your life one day you just don't know it it may save your life so it's interesting that that I get to see a different perspective on bias that's out there too because of that but thank you for asking the question you know the beauty was I did have a family when I retired because you that's what you want at the end of your career you would hope that there's a family to catch you when the military kisses you on the lips and then kicks you in the butt and, and you find yourself floating um, into, into retirement and falling, your, your family's there to catch you. Um, as a general, I was rarely at home. Um, I never got to see him. Um, and so I'm trying to make up for that now in retirement, all of those years that I do, did lose um, from not being around the family, and certainly Walter Reed. I'd get halfway up Georgia Avenue home and the beeper would go off, sir, you know, the congressman so-and-so is here, we need you to come back to the hospital, or there's no water in room 3219 and he's called the president. I'm like, okay. So I didn't get to eat dinner with the family either. Questions, other questions? Um, well, the one thing is to let it roll off your back, like, you know, these microaggressions and things like that. At this point in time, you're used to them. You, you've, and, and I'm not saying that's an excuse for it, but you should try your best to A, first of all, let those things roll off, roll off your back. The second is, if it keeps happening, then you need to just stop that person and say, I, I need to talk to you. I mean, in residency, they used to say, oh, you know, you look like Eddie Murphy. No, I don't, I don't look like Eddie Murphy. And this is a, these are my instructors, these are faculty. These aren't my classmates <laughs> telling me this. Um, or, you know, I, I always dress. Going in on Saturday to see patients, post-op patients and stuff, a lot of the guys would come in in shorts and flip-flops because it's San Antonio. And I'm like, that's not how you go in to see patients. My dad didn't raise me that way. You know, I'd put on a nice shirt, slacks, and come in. And I remember the comment was, you always look like you're on your way to a party and just happen to stop off here to see patients. And I said, no, I'm trying to look professional. You guys look like you're on the way to the beach. And I don't think any of the patients appreciate that. I mean, so sometimes you just have to speak up and do it, but you always do it in a very polite and respectful way because you recognize that they are still in positions of power over you and can stop your career dead in its tracks. So, but you can't allow it to go on. So you have to politely, politely stop it if it continues. If it's a one-time event, okay, ignorance, roll off your back. If it happens over and over again, you, you need to speak up. You need to speak up for yourself. I mean, that's how we raise our kids, right? Speak up for yourself, right? Why is it any different for us? We have to speak up for ourselves. Thank you for the question. So thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation this evening. I know the hour is late. Um, I hope I've given you a little bit of my wisdom. 
um, not that I have any wisdom, but we'll call it wisdom, um, my experiences to share. Um, if any of you would have any questions that you want to follow up with, I'm happy to serve as a mentor. I'm right over at Holy Cross Health. It's only a couple of miles away. I get my care still at Walter Reed in, um, in executive medicine. Um, and Kendra took care of me just uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And it was funny, too, because I showed up and they were like, wow, you're coming up for a, coming for a procedure and you're wearing a suit. And I'm like, yeah, why not? I mean, what's up with that? Right? Anyway, thank you all so very much, and God bless you all. Hi, Uzima family. If you like what you're seeing and what you're hearing, subscribe to our channel. Hit the bell icon below to be notified of our recent videos. What the doctor say?